Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. My name is Christian Solniski. I'm the editor of the journal Mexican Studies, Estudios Mexicanos. And it's a pleasure to um, have you for uh, today's um, event. We are very exact, excited to have Dr. John Tutino to uh, give a talk on for, for the journal and the audience of the journal. Uh, before uh, introducing uh, Dr. Tutino, I'd like to uh, say a few words about the, the, the journal and what is that we are uh, uh, trying to, uh, to do and accomplish. As you uh, probably know, uh, Mexican Studies, Estudios Mexicanos, publishes academic articles, review essays, and book reviews regarding Mexico and Mexicans you know, in the country and abroad. This is a bilingual journal and um, multidisciplinary in nature that publishes in English articles in English and in Spanish on topics in um, history, um, cultural studies, social sciences, and the humanities. And what we want to do is to foster uh, collaboration and dialogue among scholars of Mexican studies across different countries, as well as across different disciplines to, to kind of bring together and, 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 and you know, foster that kind of uh, dialogue across uh, disciplines, all to create an, a space for intellectual discussion that uh, we think is um, you know, uh, highly needed. The journal offers a, a, also a unique space for the publication of essays addressing contemporary issues that uh, related to Mexico, um, issues such as uh, violence, economic, social, and gender inequality, issues related to migration, environmental sustainability, indigenous communities, issues having to do with water, and the relationship between uh, Mexico and the US, and other uh, pressing uh, topics. So we invite uh, you all to uh, not only um, consult uh, the, uh, what the journal is publishing, but also to submit your own manuscripts uh, for, for us to be published. Uh, we also, since uh, I uh, became the editor and working together with uh, the associate editors, we uh, have embarked in a number of uh, new initiatives. Um, uh, uh, of the journal, and I want to uh, highlight some of them. First, we are we want to um, strengthen the publication of special issues and thematic sections. Those are um, special issues focused on um, any relevant uh, topics in, that brings together scholars uh, um, from different disciplines and also scholars uh, on. on about Mexico in, in different countries, often using uh, co-host editors that invite and put together um, a, an issue with um, uh, colleagues, uh, you know, from again, from different disciplines. Um, so for example, uh, we have issue 37.3 that is uh, uh, coming next uh, week with a thematic section on the bicentennial of Mexican independence. And there, there, there are three essays, one by uh, uh, John Tutino. Uh, so that will be an example of uh, the type of, of uh, thematic sections that we want to um, uh, highlight and, and, and promote. We also uh, have increased our presence on social media. So uh, we have now blogs. We, uh, we have a, a blog for each uh, issue of the journal. We invite an author of one of the articles. We have a, a short interview and that um, interview is posted on Facebook and other social media that is um, um, put by UC Press. Um, uh, in addition to that, on next year, we are gonna um, release an, um, a, an award for the best article that has been published the, the previous year. We are um, want to um, especially target scholars, young scholars who are in their early stage of their academic careers. So look for that announcement that will be coming um, uh, in January. And also uh, we want to establish an annual keynote address 
as the one that we are um, um, having uh, today. Um, because of COVID, this first one uh, it, um, is uh, virtual, but we hope uh, next year and in, 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 in the future to, uh, you know, to be face-to-face -face or, or some kind of hybrid format so that we can bring authors, readers, um, board members of the journal together uh, for this case, discussion, engage, and, and to create that, that kind of uh, sense of uh, intellectual community, scholarly community that I was uh, uh, referring to. So we the, uh, encourage you again to uh, submit your manuscripts or if you are thinking about, uh, for example, um, uh, proposing an special issue and a thematic section, you can reach out to, to me as editor or, or any one uh, of the associate editors. And so we welcome your submissions and, and contacting us for your, for your questions. Um, I want now to thank uh, the associate editors who have been, uh, we've been working together since 2020 uh, on many of these initiatives and ideas. Uh, Ruben Hernandez de Leon at UCLA, Aurora Diaz Canedo de la UNAM in Mexico, and Marta Judith Sanchez also at UNAM. In addition, I want to thank uh, the assistant director, Anna de Kaiser, with whom those of you who are authors have been probably in contact, um, as well as the um, uh, Ignacio Ruiz Perez, who is the book uh, review editor uh, of the journal. Also, my thanks to the board members who have uh, contributed to um, promote this event and, and, and the journal with their uh, contacts. And last but not least, the UCLA Latin American Institute uh, for facilitating the uh, platform that we are using today for, for the event, especially Ruben Hernandez de Leon and Brian Pitts. Now, uh, uh, there is no, uh, uh, John Tutino needs no introduction, but still I'm gonna <laughs> introduce him. It's, it's my, uh, my pleasure. We are very thankful for, for him to come on board and be our first um, speaker for this uh, series. Uh, Dr. Tutino is professor of history and international affairs in the history department and the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He is a rather prolific author of many books uh, that have been published in English, translated in Spanish, um, among many others, uh, uh, from insurrection to revolution in Mexico, social basis of agrarian violence in Mexico that was published by Princeton University and then ERA in 1990, Making a New War, Founding Capitalism in the Bajio and the Spanish North America that was published by Duke and later on Fondo, Fondo de Cultura and Economica, The Mexican Harlan, How Communities Shape Capitalism, A Nation and War History uh, that was published by Princeton in 2018 and Fondo de Cultura Economica uh, uh, that is coming in 22, among many others. More currently, uh, John was uh, sharing with us his uh, working to complete a new book that is uh, called, or I guess tentatively titled, The Bajio Revolution, 1800 to 1860, Claiming Community, Breaking Solar Capitalism, Constraining, Mexi Constraining Mexico, Remaking North America that is under contract uh, by Duke University uh, Press. So again, we uh, want to uh, thank you sincerely, John, to be with um, us um, uh, today. Um, uh, I have a talk that uh, is falls within the uh, larger theme of the bicentennial of Mexican uh, independence. Now, uh, the talk will uh, last for about 40 minutes. And after that, we are going to open it up for a, a Q and A for um, anybody in the audience. And um, so, for that purpose, we'll um, ask you to uh, please post your um, questions using the Q and A tab that is uh, on the you know down on your um, screen. 
And even though the, the presentation is going to be in English, you can post your questions in either English or, or in Spanish, and we'll uh, then uh, read them to Professor Tutino. So without further ado, it's my pleasure uh, uh, to pass the virtual mic now to, to John and give him a, a very warm welcome. Adelante, John. Thank you, Christian and Ruben and everyone else who's helped bring this together. Um, and it's really an opportunity for me because as I work on this project that pivots on the conflicts of 1808 to 1821, I am learning new things every day. So in fact, there are some things I will try out today that I hadn't figured out yet. When a year ago, I finished drafting the essay that's coming out in the new um, issue of Mexican studies. Um, and the title I settled on for this one is The Fall of New Spain, pause, and the impossible dream of making Mexico. And it starts in 1821. When Iturbide and the Iguala movement dreamed of restoring New Spain under a Mexican monarchy, led by Fernando VII, the reigning king of Spain. Is that a movement for independence? At least we can say contradictions ruled. And that movement did end up breaking the tie with Spain. And it set off a half century of conflict in search of a Mexican nation. And after 1821, conflict seems to reign. And as a result, Mexican independence has often seemed to be something caught between being a calamity and a failure. But what I wanna to argue today is neither the problem nor the primary process was independence in the sense of the politics of making a nation. But instead, that Iturbide and the Iguala movement dreamed of reviving New Spain, a society that had been broken in revolutionary conflicts between 1808 and 1820. So to make the case, I've got to begin by refocusing many of my readers, listeners on what is to me the obvious reality of New Spain that is rarely seen. It was a place of power, prosperity, stability, and global importance before 1810. It was the richest, most populous, most socially diverse kingdom colony or nation in the Americas in 1810. And it was a kingdom. It was never a colony and certainly not Mexico before 1821 when the name applied only to the city. To just summarize the core importance, in the 18th century, New Spain silver provided 60% of the global money supply. That silver fueled trades linking China and India, Europe and the Americas, including, and I can't go into the details of how, the trade in enslaved Africans coming to the plantation worlds of the Americas. That silver and the trades it drove concentrated power and capital in Mexico City. Something that everyone knows and few recognize. Nobody ever sent capital to Mexico City or New Spain before 1810. By 1821, Mexico was in search of outside capital. The simplest example of the transformation. Um, before 1810, 
it's important to recognize and why one cannot call New Spain a colony. Spain was an increasingly fragile imperial power dependent upon New Spain to retain a role in the world, economically, militarily, et cetera. Within New Spain, it was the core engine of what I call civil capitalism. It's energized by silver mining, but it was sustained by diverse producing communities. The indigenous republics that dominated rural society across the Mesoamerican regions from around Mexico City all the way south into Guatemala. Self-governing landed communities. Yes, they were republics, though again, so many who don't focus on the region refuse to recognize that, though speaking through a UCLA forum, my former mentor and the great scholar of New Spain, Jim Lockhart, made the case unquestionably as such. Um, in the north, from the Bajio going north, silver capitalism depended upon the production of what I call amalgamating more Hispanic communities. They're formed by diverse immigrants from diverse Mesoamerican cultures, mixing with diverse Africans dragged in as slaves, who mixed, matched, liberated themselves, and by the 18th century were what we might call Indo-Mulatos, free, dependent, and producing to sustain the core of silver capitalism. Living dependent on estate lands from the Bahia North, they were communities without formal rights. It, that context made New Spain a society of power and prosperity, and yes, of deep inequities. But that society of power, wealth, and inequity was integrated and sustained by a regime of diverse laws and rights for diverse people and sustained by judicial mediations. In other words, for all the talk of an authoritarian imposing regime, it was ruled by judicial mediation, helped along by the ample wealth at the top. And the fact that through the 18th century, the vast majority of people producing at the bottom either had access to landed autonomy with enough land to sustain families, or lived in what I called dependent security on estates in the North. And so it was unequal, globally important, and stabilized by a particular kind of judicial regime. So let me quickly turn to the process of breaking New Spain that ran from about 1808 to 1820. And little of this analysis is simple, except its beginning. New Spain was not crumbling. It was not cracking. It was not laden with people seeking independence or any other radical change until in 1808, Napoleon invaded Spain. And if you want to credit or blame anyone, Napoleon will do. Napoleon invaded Spain, dreaming explicitly, clear in the work of Stanley and Barbara Stein. His goal was to gain New Spain silver, which in 1808 and 9 was flowing at its absolute historic peak. This is not a society and economy cracking. Why did Napoleon want that silver? He wanted it because he had lost Haiti and its revenues to revolutionary ex-slaves in 1804, leaving him to fight a Britain drawing resources from the world 
with no resources from beyond Europe to help his French forces. At the same time, if his goal was understandable, he started with another absolutely impossible dream, an absurdity, because Trafalgar in 1807 had destroyed both the French and Spanish neighbors. He could take Spain, but he had no means of moving New Spain silver across the ocean, an ocean dominated by England. But he set off conflicts that got away from him and everybody else. I characterize what happens in Spain in 1808 as Napoleon's beheading of the Spanish monarchy. He eliminated the monarch at its head. That quickly set off a summer of mobilization in Mexico City, where officials, both imperial and local, elites, mining, commercial, and landed, and commoners of diverse stripes mobilized in halls of power and in city streets to debate routes to an interim autonomy via varieties of popular sovereignties. Went on for months until in September of 1808, the debates and New Spain's established regime were taken down by a military coup, not organized by the local marginal Yermo. He worked for military commanders sent from Seville to ensure that New Spain silver would continue to flow to the fight against Napoleon in Spain. And a, re a revelation worth remembering. The morning after the coup, the commanders who promoted it put out a document both justifying the military toppling of an established judicial regime and asserted that those who did it acted as the people. The military claimed popular sovereignty. In ending debate seeking popular sovereignty and breaking the established regime. One more irony of that summer of 1808, rarely recognized. That summer of mobilization is too often presented as a great innovation. It wasn't. The rising came in the long established Spanish tradition of the sovereignty of the pueblos the communities, the towns. Yes, it went on to add into the debates the sovereignty of the Pueblo, the people, la nación, the French variant. But it began in a Hispanic tradition. The September coup broke tradition. It broke the established Spanish regime of judicial mediation and imposed militarized rule in a new Spain where there had been modest military forces at the ports and on the Northern frontier, but nothing but weak militias internally. All right, the change in the summer of 08 mattered. It, it began the transformation of the regime. For the next two years, from 1808 to 1810, silver flowed to Spain at continuing historic peaks. 1809 was the highest year of production and export in the history of New Spain. 1810 was on the same course until insurgency ended everything in the fall. But while that's going on, Napoleon's armies took all of the peninsula except Cadiz. At the same time, while silver's flowing and Seville is failing and falling to Napoleon, in New Spain, the first two years of really radical drought 
since the mid 1980s, sent maize prices to famine peaks. And in that context, and I ask you to contemplate the self-destructive absurdity in all of this, powerful agrarian capitalists who had recently been public in proclaiming demands and rights of popular sovereignty, equally publicly were profiteering from starvation, selling stored maize at unconscionable prices. And that came in the context, and here I can't go into a lot of detail, um, in a way, it's what the whole second half of Making a New World is about. In the prior decades, the relatively stable social relations in the Bahio had become subject to what I call accelerating predations, rising rents, falling incomes in the regions around Guanajuato. That had been building, leading to discontent, and then the predations of, of profiteering from hunger built upon it. That was peaking when in the summer of 1810, while Spain collapsed and too many starved in New Spain, provincial elites gathered in Querétaro to seek provincial rights, essentially seeking in Querétaro what had been tried in Mexico City two years earlier. But now they're meeting amidst fears of popular risings. The I don't, this group is so often called conspirators, and they weren't. They were essentially a political debating society. They were stymied, unable to act, because their urge for political autonomy ran into fears of popular insurgency. And while they failed to act, officials learned of what was going on, and the Querétaro participants were arrested. At San Miguel and Dolores, nearby towns, Allende and Hidalgo learned the news and fearing arrest called for insurgency on September 16th, 1810. They quickly gained a political military following of about 1500. And in the following days and weeks saw from 20,000 to 40,000 popular insurgents, men from rural estate communities mostly, take arms to take food, food they themselves had produced but could not obtain for their families. For the next four months, Hidalgo, Allende, and other rebel leaders struggled to restrain popular insurgents who sacked Bahio Haciendas endlessly and Guanajuato's mines twice when they were joined by Guanajuato mine workers. That first revolt only lasted four months. Early in 1811, Hidalgo and his forces were defeated by mobilized militias from farther north around San Luis Potosí, the defeats outside Guadalajara. He and Allende are soon captured, tried, and executed. What is too often missed is that in the aftermath of Hidalgo's political defeat, thousands of popular, mostly rural insurgents returned home to estate communities in Guanajuato and carried on an insurgency to take and make family sustenance for a decade. In the shadow of what they were doing, Others pursued similar fights, notably just west around Guadalajara, and also in the Mesquital, which pivotally sits between the capital and the Real del Monte mines. But as history is always complicated, and I won't go into the details today, Querétaro, between the Guanajuato insurgents and the Mesquital, rural communities stayed loyal and allowed local powers to fight against insurgency. Still, by 1812, mining across New Spain, led by near full collapse at Guanajuato, had fallen to half the levels of 1809. And in key regions of insurgency, the agrarian capitalism that had sustained silver, 
capitalism broke apart in the face of popular insurgency. The result was between 1810 and 12, there is what I call the insurgent forced fall of silver capitalism. The best way I can illustrate that to you, the, the fall of New Spain silver by 50%, remembering that New Spain silver was 60% of the global money supply cut the global money supply by 30%. And I always say to my students, if you don't think that's a lot, at what level of decline in the money supply do we start to scream? Two tenths of a percent, half a percent? We can't imagine what a 30% collapse of the global money supply does to global trade. But we know what it did. It radically and quickly broke the trades that had made China and India global leaders in production and trade, and it ended the historic concentration of capital in Mexico City. Silver capitalism and the world it had powered were gone by 1812, leaving China, India, and New Spain upside down stealing the phrase, the great Chinese scholar who documented the impact of the loss of New World silver in China, though she didn't know that it was New Spain's insurgents who caused it, Man Wan Ling called her book China Upside Down, describing the fall of China with the loss of silver. And at the same time, the loss of New Spain silver and the fall of China and India's production of cotton goods too, opened the world and New Spain too to floods of British industrial cottons. As the great British historian Robert Allen shows, though he doesn't quite recognize it, up until 1812, British cottons barely held their own against Indian produced South Asian cotton. It was between 1812 and 1815 that British cottons took off and came to control the world markets. I know the British should be thanking Guanajuato insurgents. I'm also confident they never will. Um, in the same year, 1812, in a radically new world they really could not see yet, Spanish liberals wrote a new constitution at Cadiz. And it too, so often separated as bringing electoral rights and popular sovereignty to the Spanish empire. But we need to remember that that constitution and the offering of those rights were produced to back and legitimate military powers in Spain and New Spain. Linking, and I say again, ironically, given Napoleon's role, French visions of universal law adopted in Cadiz to back armed Spanish power fighting armed French power. Essentially copying Napoleon to defeat Napoleon in Spain and keep new Spain. At the same time, what the Cadiz constitution does, rarely recognized, subverted, called to end the rule of multiple laws and mediating justice that had long sustained Spanish rule and silver capitalism in what by 1812 was no longer the richest kingdom in the Americas. Meanwhile, continued wars against insurgents, both political and popular, consolidated military power and innovation at the core of New Spain's regime. To rush you through some complex history that I will detail in the book to come. In 1814, Fernando returned to power in Spain 
and quickly abrogated the liberal constitution, turning against the people who had fought to bring him back to power. Never a smart move. In 1815, Iturbide, a regional commander at that point, defeated Morelos. At that point, marginalizing, though not quite ending, political insurgency in Mexico. In 1816, the regions around Guadalajara and the Mezquital pacified, enabling the beginnings of a revival of commercial production in both regions and mining at Real del Monte. But again, what I emphasize and has to be recognized from 1814 to 1820, guerrilla forces across Guanajuato and insurgent communities that sustain them carried on in armed rebellion, grounded in control of production they had claimed on the land. It was only, and it took two years from 1818 to 1820, for the military, now with nobody else to fight in New Spain, to pacify rural Guanajuato. But they did it in the most revealing of ways. The pacification did guarantee a state property. But the military also guaranteed former insurgent communities rights to work the lands they had taken in insurgency as tenants, smallholders, limited to paying minor rents and to retain arms to protect officially the patria, but ultimately to protect their rights to their own communities and to control of production. With guerrilla power set on the land, agrarian capitalism was gone. A state property held in Guanajuato, but communities of small producers ruled production. And in a theme I dealt with in an article years ago, within those former insurgent communities, an amazing group of women rose to new roles of power. It was, I would argue, a revolution within capitalism. I it retained property, it didn't attack markets, et cetera. A revolution within capitalism that transformed Guanajuato while Silver capitalism as a dynamic, globally important force faded into the past. To summarize where New Spain was in 1820, and it was still New Spain. Silver remained down by 50% from 1809, and it remained at that level into the 1840s. It actually fell more in the 1820s and then rose back to that 50% level into the 1840s. The global trade silver had driven thus remained broken. And you wanna think about opium conflicts, opium wars, et cetera, it's all linked. Capital accumulation in Mexico City was gone, never to revive. Yes, property held for landed elites, but debts mounted and profits were absolutely done. There was no longer profit in the land, in the Bajio or much of elsewhere in New Spain. In another contradiction, indigenous republics held strong in 1820, even as liberals grounded in Cadiz dreamed of abolishing them, they couldn't do it. They depended upon those republics to sustain the fight against insurgents. Bahio insurgent communities held strong and armed on the land. And they quickly became a model for others dependent on lands, on private property, while owners struggled to plant for profit and markets crashed. And again, not being able to go into it in detail today, women kept the powers they had claimed 
overproduction during insurgency in Guanajuato. And as once powerful landed clans collapsed, women within them repeatedly took control. And those that survived often survived less rich, less powerful, but still landed by women's efforts. And then in 1822, military commanders in Spain forced Fernando to restore the Cadiz constitution, demonstrating as clearly as one could that coercion was grounded, that coercion grounded power and that constitutionalism served as a facilitating, legitimating cover for militarized power. It was in that context that in 1821, Iturbide mobilized long loyalist military forces, those who had fought against insurgents and independence. He did recruit Vicente Guerrero for other reasons to a movement backed by leading churchmen and landed oligarchs, all facing challenge and decline as silver capitalism faded into the past the goal to demand a Mexican monarchy with a Mexican constitution on the model of Cadiz to be headed by Fernando if he would come to reign in Mexico. The goal at the beginning is not independence, but a revival of New Spain without Spain, which proved impossible in a kingdom transformed by a decade of revolutionary violence pressed from below. Okay, minimalist continuities. Yes, Catholicism held strong, but in diverse Catholicisms, he pluralized, elite and institutional, popular and indigenous in diverse mixes. Indigenous republics held strong too, despite liberal dreams of abolition, they carried on in adamant informality. The search for a Mexican regime also began laden with contradictions. The collapse of mining left revenues half the level of before 1810, while standing military forces with political clout had to be paid. The result were perpetual deficits into the 1870s. Dreams of reviving silver faced the loss of capital once created in Mexico City. Some turned to England, which failed to restore the mines. But British capital demanded open imports for British cloth, breaking the textile industry that had long kept New Spain self-sufficient in everyday clothing. Fernando, of course, refused to come. Iturbide they named himself emperor. And very quickly in 1823 fell as a wider community of political men pursued a federal republic. Their 1824 constitution sought a regime of regional states, each with a distinct economy and society, all seeking regionally different, and I put it in quotes, universal rights. Mining revenues went to the states, helping a few to better funding. Import revenues would sustain federal power and never could. Mexicans seeking to build a nation and a commercial economy to sustain it faced decades of conflict and instability. In that context, Anglo-Texans seceded to take Texas for cotton and slavery in 1835-36. The United States invaded to claim Texas for cotton and slavery and California for gold and continental hegemony from 1846 to 48. Then France invaded to take Mexico for an imagined empire from 1863 to 67. In that light, independence and the search for a Mexican nation appears to have been impossible and a calamity. And for state makers and profit seekers, that was inescapable truth. 
But in conclusion, we have to remember that 80% of the people proclaimed Mexicans in 1821 lived in communities on the land. A majority in indigenous republics that endured and often strengthened despite liberal dreams of abolition. While the ranchero tenant communities built an insurgency in the Bajio not only held strong, but spread across surrounding regions. Women held strong in Bahia communities and in landed clans struggling to survive too. The fall of silver capitalism in New Spain solidified family and community lives on the land while state makers flailed for half a century. The majority gained and they gained what they wanted, autonomy on the land, while power seekers flailed. It's a contradiction worth contemplating, a history worth knowing better. And reminds us that perhaps nations don't matter more than people. And I'll leave you with a thought to ponder. Does this history of popular power and persistence, prejudicing profit and state power after 1810, explain why so many among the powerful and the power seekers in Mexico work to break community power from the 1850s. And in the process, with some success, they provoked a second community-based revolution in 1910. Things to think about, and thank you. Well, thank you very much, John, for such a, a you know, thought-provoking uh, talk. Um, again, I, I want to remain, remind the audience, um, his essay would be soon published as part of a thematic section on the bicentennial of Mexican independence and, and kind of uh, showcasing uh, what we wanted to emphasize is to, in that thematic section to open up and bring in new perspectives, fresh perspectives on, on topic. And I think that your, your talk have touched on, on some of those um, um, uh, perspectives uh, today. So um, I want to also remind uh, people attending uh, that you can post your uh, questions in either English or Espanol on the Q&A. So um, then um, we can have a, a nice um, conversation and, and discussion. And to that end, um, we have a, a few that have already come and um, I'm gonna read uh, them. The, the first one, Von del Valle, so I have a question, uh, uh, Professor Tutino is saying that New Spain was not a colony. I understand what he says about Spain's weakness and New Spain's booming due to what he calls civil capitalism. And yet I wonder about the internal social hierarchies, Indians, Africans, etc. So the question is, if New Spain was not a colony in 1810, what was it then? And what is Mexico? Now in 2021, what what would be then a colonial ordering of society? <laughs> so I guess that that's a <laughs> a, a complex question. Would be it's a complex like question, and I'll just provide a few points to further thinking about it. First of all, explicitly and legally, New Spain is a one of the many kingdoms of the Spanish crown. You read any document of the era and it reads, I name a king, Rey de. And after España, well, the multiple kingdoms in Spain, you get to New Spain, et cetera. So it is form, and that is why, for example, there is a central figure called a viceroy, the vice king, for which there was no parallel human in the British colonies. Yes, they were colonies on the coast of North America, each one separately reporting to a government in Spain. So formally and legally, it was not a colony. Boy, in terms of hierarchies of exploitation, 
um, in so many ways. Yes, they existed in New Spain, but they operated in what I want to call sustainable, livable ways in which the subordinate had access to justice. The great work of William Taylor shows that the vast majority of indigenous um, risings in New Spain were a day long aimed to claim the attention of judges and gained livable resolutions. Parallel exploitations and equities carried on in the nation of Mexico. Parallel exploitations, some would say worse in the 19th century, carried on as slavery deepened and intensified across the United States. And you know, New Spain incorporated to subordinate indigenous people. My wonderful neighbors in Anglo North America simply obliterated them to take the land. Um, I guess my point is we need concepts that don't suggest that such horrible exploitations are somehow primarily colonial. They're often national. Um, and to me, we need to recognize, and I guess I can have my utopian moments, but I'm waiting for utopia to happen. I'm waiting for a society of full shared equity to come. And a historian who recognizes the um, structured inequities that mark the world of capitalism, it seems not about to go away. The question becomes how they operate, how they're addressed, how people live within them. And we need to start finding ways to think about those changes and transformations and to make a point, to stop attributing the worst of this to the past. Sometimes the worst is not in the past. And I'll stop there. Thank you, John. Um, next question I'm going to pose comes from uh, Fernando Perez Montesinos. Thank you for turning a familiar story into a revealing global one. Can you elaborate a bit on how the disruption of silver supplies undercut Indian textiles, helping British ones along the way? OK. Um, boy, that's a complicated story, and it's why I avoid it. I'll try to do it with a little more. All right. Indian textiles were the primary price demanded by African kings and princes to sell slaves, human beings, to European merchants to labor in the Americas. It is why the British had first gone to India to control those textiles to accelerate their participation in the slave trade. But Indian buyers demanded silver. And that, I must say, China was a one, you know, was silver only, not bimetallic. India was bimetallic, but the cotton economy demanded silver. And I actually don't yet have an explanation for that preference, but it's true. That I know, it was dominant. Without silver, Indian cottons are no longer available to sell to African princes and merchants to buy the slaves to take to the Americas. Now, that trade boom through the 18th century up until the Haitian Revolution. And sadly, despite all kinds of proclamations and opposition by the British in the United States, it rose to new heights in the early 19th century. In that process, and it's one of the reasons arguably that the British, people rarely ask, why did the great woolen manufacturers of Europe, the British, turned to cottons in the 1780s. They wanted cottons to compete with India and to compete with India in the slave trades. When silver disappeared, after 1810, African 
buyers had no option but British cottons. And other scholars have documented that British cotton goods that don't require silver, but that do require enslaved hands in the US South became the primary exchange for the African slaves coming to the Americas, to Brazil and Cuba into the 19th century. And all the while the US and Britain are shrieking their opposition to the international slave trade. Note, they did nothing to effectively curtail it till 1850. And as my students have endlessly heard me say, watch what people do grounded in their interests, not what they say to legitimate their powers. Hope that helps a little. Thank you. Um, the next question actually is in, in, in Espanol. Uh, Bien. Daniel Flores and, and turn to a little bit of a different uh, angle. Angle, buenos días, doctor. Usted asume el punto de que el reino de la Nueva España fue precisamente eso, un reino con las mismas prerrogativas que los demás reinos de la monarquía universal universal católica, entre paréntesis, quizá el mejor ejemplo de una monarquía compuesta, con lo cual estoy parcialmente de acuerdo. Sin embargo, no considera que las reformas borbónicas y la inatención legalista frente a la invasión napoleónica evidencian el carácter colonial de este reino frente a los peninsulares. Pues, gracias. Siempre hay complicaciones más. Varios historiadores han mostrado que sí, las reformas borbónicas intentaban hacer colonia del reino de la Nueva España. Pero con estudio cuidadoso de los conflictos de los años 60 y después. Cada uno de los intentos borbónicos de colonizar a Nueva España fracasó porque España necesitaba la plata y las reformas que debilitaban la producción de plata no podían durar. Y por eso, sí, formalmente España tenía algunos derechos mayores, pero Nueva España tenía poder y riqueza tanto más. Entonces, para mí, nunca llegó efectivamente a ser colonia. Gracias. Um, the, uh, the next question it, uh, takes us uh, a little bit in a different direction. Um, Sandra Mendiola um, has a question about the Mesquital Valley in the process and, and particularly, uh, you know, if you could uh, clarify what was the role of the Mes Mesquital Valley from 1808 to 1821 or at least in the first uh, years. Of course, and thank you. Um, first, I wanna say is there's a whole chapter in the Mexican heartland on the revolution in the Mezquital from 1810 to 1816. So there's a lot of detail there. And the second thing I'll say, a former MA student of mine now holding a PhD from Yale and teaching at San Angelo State in Texas, Jonathan Graham has written the most amazingly massive dissertation on the Mezquital in Mexican history, including massive materials on this era. So yeah, we know a lot about the Mezquital and it's complicated. The Mezquital says a lot by its name, it's dry. And in the 18th century, when population grew in the regions around Mexico City and population growth corroded the autonomy of landed families in the local indigenous republics. In 1800, most of them could produce all of their own food. By nine, I'm sorry, 1700. By 1800, most village families were lucky to produce half their food. 
population had doubled. But the vast majority of them carried on because their communities, led by labor gang captains, organized and controlled seasonal labor at nearby haciendas, gaining the income to complement production and keep families going. That's been documented for the Valley of Toluca, for Morelos, for the Valley of Mexico. But in the Mesquital in the Northeastern Valley of Mexico, it's dry. The haciendas there, led by the Jesuits, my good employers, um, turned, instead of maximizing grain cultivation on estate lands, turned to pulque. Pulque uses dry land and needs no labor, essentially, except for seasonal transplantings about every five, eight years. The result is the communities in the Mesquital face the same population growth and shortages of land on drier, less productive lands and without local access to regular labor supplements. So when Hidalgo and his forces march by to the West on their way to Toluca and Monte de las Cruces, the communities of the Mesquital rose up and started sacking haciendas. They had a parallel insurgency, but in a region of indigenous republics. And they undermined local agrarian production and stopped mining at Real del Monte from 1810 to 1815. And it's a key parallel because they sit between the mines and the capital. And one of the things I've learned in all of my studies is that insurrection doesn't have to be everywhere but it needs to be strategically located. So when insurrection is in the Bajio, which is the core engine of silver capitalism, and in the Mesquital between the Real del Monte mines and the capital, you can rattle everything, even though only small regions are actively at arms. Century later, the fact that Zapata is literally on the ridge looking down at Mexico City makes him a more serious threat. And I will cynically say, sadly say, the second round Zapatistas in 1994 just couldn't have the same impact sitting in the lowlands of Chiapas. Um, location matters in a lot of these things. Um, and again, that all of that, by the way, again, I'll sell a book, the Mexican hotland links the Mezquital rising to the Bajio Risings in eight, after 1810. It links the Zapata Risings in Morelos, obviously to things farther north with Villa in 1910. And it concludes with an examination of why the modern Zapatistas could make a statement but could not impact power in the same way. Thank you. That's a very, <laughs> uh, quite interesting uh, reflection. And, and, and maybe we can come back later on thinking about the implications of your talk of more contemporary times. Uh, now I, I have a, we have a question of uh, one of our associate editors, um, Aurora Diaz Canedo. Uh, uh, bienvenida. Uh, ¿Nos podría explicar un poco la participación de las mujeres a que se refirió durante los años de la guerra de independencia? And I want to also add that as part of, uh, of um, the contribution of, of uh, John Tudino's essay that will be um, uh, published uh, soon. Um, the, I actually detailed the best known case of this in the article that I call the most important thing I ever wrote that nobody read. Um, it was published in the Distinguished Hispanic American Historical Review in 1998. It was called The Revolution in Mexican Independence. And its subtitle was about the insurgency and the transformation of power production and patriarchy. And I documented there thanks to access to some amazing local records from the Guanajuato Hacienda de Puerto de Nieto that during the insurgency, while the men were out fighting as guerrillas, women rose to take control of production within the communities. That before insurgency, if, oh, 5% of rural households, whether laborers or tenants were women, that was amazing. When the insurgency ended, 
a third of the most powerful tenant rancheras in 1820 at Puerto Nieto were women. And they headed families that included subordinate men and they employed men in their fields. Talk about upside down. That is a rural society upside down. And thankfully those documents continued to 1827 and those women held and expanded their role into the decade after independence when the records end. And from there on, I only have hints. But in 1826, the first governor of the state of Guanajuato, a guy named Montes de Oca, in his first you know, memoria, basically the state of the state address, spent a third of the tax on the need to control uppity women. Something was going on beyond Puerto de Nieto. The governor would not have addressed only Puerto de Nieto. Um, and I've been able to expand on this in detail without nearly as good sources in the chapters I'm currently writing. At another level, as powerful families faced economic dissolution, women took over. A famous well-documented case because her letters were published in Historia Mexicana back in the 50s. The Condesa de Regla took over the family and would not let her adult son who reached his majority, had a city council seat, everything else. In 1816, she kept his hands off family economic affairs till she died. And once she died, he started losing things. She kept everything together. Um, the, much of my work has been built on the family papers and letters of family, well, it goes way back, but it starts with Caballero Osillo in, in Querétaro, passes through, it's the documents of Jose Sanchez Espinosa from the 1780s through the 1820s that taught me so much, and then his son, the flailing Conde de Penasco, tried to carry on. And the family letters show Penasco went through two, two wives while the family fortunes dissolved. And both wives did everything they could to move him aside. One of whom finally wrote a series of letters to all the family estate administrators saying, ignore him, he's destroying everything. The only letters that will manage state affairs are mine, we rule. And I'm now, by the way, since I wrote all that stuff, I've now just, I'm concluding chapters on Queretaro after the insurgency that document the rise of a series of powerful women who take control and rule. So, and by the way, to advertise a friend's work, um, Margaret Chowning at Berkeley is about to publish an important new book on women, on religious women in politics in Mexico starting in the 1840s. And her data, I had the good fortune to have read the manuscript. Her data shows the women's role in politics and she shows it started in the Bajio. What I've been able to document is these women are taking control of their own family financing and church financing in the 1830s and 40s. Of course, religious and right-leaning politicians listen to them politically. Um, they had the financial power. Thank you, uh, John. Um, the next question actually focuses on, on yet another of the important social and, and political actors that, uh, that you uh, address in your essay. Um, Richard Grijalva asked if, I'm wondering uh, um, to what extent you found anomalies among the indigenous republics that broke toward the, toward the insurgency and movements for independence? Um, in my appearance, it is only in the Mesquital that a core of indigenous republics, a region of indigenous republics overwhelmingly turned to insurgency. The republics of the Valley of Toluca ignored Hidalgo when he marched through in the fall of 1810. And 
it's not the, the skirmish at Montes de las Cruces, it's that the indigenous republics of the Valley of Toluca wouldn't feed him and his marching hordes um, that explains his inability to stay. When Morelos faced the siege of Cuautla in 18, who was it, 12 or 13, pardon, dates fade through, um, he lost, why? Because the indigenous republics of the Morelos Basin, the very communities that would later make Zapata's movement, just stayed home, stayed back. They knew that their rights to land and self-rule were grounded in the regime. And by the way, to make the contrast clear, and this is an article in an UNAM volume that I published, it is the popular I'm sorry, the political insurgents from Rayon at Zitacuaro through Morelos and others adamantly defended property rights and then wondered why the popular insurgents of the Bahia wouldn't back them. It's a tripartite battle before 1815. The regime's defending regime and property. Political insurgents are challenging the regime and defending property. Popular insurgents are mostly challenging property, but are happy to let the regime collapse if that's necessary, or to live with it, if not. So, and there's very little, you know, Morelos marches through Oaxaca, but there's no sign of massive indigenous uprising in a massively indigenous region. Um, yeah, they're scattered. Um, the regions around Jalisco, insurgency mixed between the state communities and some indigenous republics. It's the closest thing to a mixed set of insurgencies. Um, and there I will refer to the essays by my friend and colleagues, both William Taylor and Eric Van Young in the wonderful volume that Friedrich Katz put together called Riot, Rebellion and Revolution years ago. Thank you. Well, we are uh, running out of time, but uh, uh, we still have just a, a couple of minutes. I'm, I'm going to pose the, the, the last question. Um, Carl Browner, uh, building on, on your former comments about the role of uh, women, you, you mentioned women having a significant power during this period. And he's asking, are you talking also about indigenous women or, or not indigenous or, or, or both? How did they come to have this power and what factors were responsible okay. for uh, its, um, its uh, loss? Yes. Um, so my primary data is for the Bahio. And there the question is, what's indigenous? The population of the Bahio is often officially tri tribute paying somewhere between being Indio and mulatto. And they often are between Indio and mulatto. And one of the things I've been, people chose, the urban chose mulatto, the rural chose Indio. But in fact, they're all mixed in parallel ways. Um, and there's plenty of, of rebellious women, rising women in that world. Less clear in the indigenous republics because data for women's roles in the republics that are formally patriarchal. One of the problems is getting to data. But now I'm going to do a sales job for the wonderful dissertation in progress of a student of mine named Rebecca Andrews Barton, who's been doing comparative studies of women in the indigenous communities, the Chinampa communities of Xochimilco, and the dry land communities just east at Chalco. And what she has been able to document by using parish records, that in the Chinampa communities, where family production ruled and women ruled market contacts selling locally and in Mexico City. The money came through women. Women from the 1700s through the 1840s dominated social and cultural life. Women alone were 50, 60% of all padrinos, men, in couples, but it was usually the woman who was the power in the couple, and men alone were only less than 20%. And the contrast with women and family ways 30 miles east at Chalco, 
where it's the traditional men rule the land and earn wages at the hacienda. And there men ruled community, social, religious life. If all goes well, there will be a first presentation of this result at the Mexicanist Historical Gathering in Austin a year from now. And after that, who knows, it will come. So I think it's, it's a pivotal question. And one of the issues is it's hard to get inside. Um, the wonderful work by Lisa Sousa on women in indigenous families um, just was able to show, but mostly at the level of community politics, women were powerful in Oaxaca, less so around Mexico City. But her sources didn't get her deeply within communities, and that's not her problem, that's the source's problem. So it, it's, it's a problem to get at and solve, but we need to cease presuming that there's nothing to look for. What's clear is beneath the structured preference for patriarchy in the documents, there are conflicts and negotiations and diversities we got to discover. Thank you, John, for yeah, fascinating discussion and, and thought-provoking, you know, uh, uh, responses. And and, and for, uh, there are more questions that are coming at the Q and A, but unfortunately, we run out of uh, time. Um, uh, uh, let's give a, a, a virtual <laughs> applause to. <laughs> John Tudino, thank you very much for, for your you contribution all. and talk uh, today, as well as the um, everybody who's been um, following um, his talk.